how many of you actually go to the second page of a Google search ever? So when you go to do a search in Google, you expect that the first 10 responses are going to be probably what you're looking for. But it isn't always. And how do you make sure that your website, your club's website, your small business website is set up to catch exactly what people would be searching for and that they find you in that first page? Please help me welcome Jamak, Distinguished Toastmaster, sharing with us basic SEO. If you have tuned into and are viewing the District 96 Toastmasters YouTube channel, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. If it is your first time on these um, on these series, on this series that we're doing, I suggest, or if you're watching this video afterwards, I really recommend you go back and watch the first one first, then the second one, then the third one, because these things are designed to build on top of each other. They're concepts to... Uh, introduce you to various pieces of the puzzle of digital marketing. Um, sometimes people call it social media marketing. Some, sometimes people call it SEO, as it actually is the topic of today. But as I've explained in the past, those are actually not correct in the majority of uh, time that people use it. These are concepts that fall into a bigger umbrella of digital marketing, if you can call it that, or um, yeah, digital marketing. So today's topic is search engine optimization, SEO for short. It is, I was just before starting, I was telling the people that were on the line that this is probably the most difficult one to try and get our arms around within the span of whatever, an hour, an hour and a half. These work workshops in general are designed to give you an overview of how things work. They're not designed for you to be able to get out of this workshop and go do it. They're designed to give you a bit of a roadmap so you know what to look for, what not to look for. And if you're a business owner, if you're hiring somebody, it helps you not get scammed. Especially with SEO in particular, there are a lot, and I mean a lot of companies around all over the world that claim to be able to get you results with SEO. There are people who call themselves or actually are Google certified, um, but that certification comes with a few hours of online training. Does not mean they're experts in, in much. Um, so we'll go over it. This particular one, I, it's going to be a lot of concepts. I'm going to try to introduce a lot of concepts to you. Hopefully, you know, I'll be able to get that point across, uh, but, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what we get by the end of this, um, this session. I want to start today by a little story. I started driving when I was, actually, I learned how to drive when I was, I think, 16, 17, around there. I didn't get my first car, which was a 1988 Honda Civic. I still remember it was this red little car that I, I absolutely loved. But I didn't get this car until the first year that I started going to UBC. I think my parents felt bad for me to drive like go, trying to, to catch the bus from the North Shore to UBC every day. And then sometimes, you know, I'd stay up in the middle of the night studying at the library, trying to get back. It was a headache. So, you know, I got a car. And um, <laughs> very quickly after that, I got introduced to speeding tickets. <laughs> and then I remember the very first time that somebody introduced me to a little device called a radar detector. Does anybody, who knows what a radar detector is by a show of hands? Okay, not everybody. So I'll explain just really quickly. A radar detector is a little device you mount on the dash of your car and it's, it has the ability to tell you if there's a police officer with a little radar uh, clocking your speed, you know, measuring your speed. So these things, I think at that point in time, we're going for like 300 bucks. And I figured, hey, if it saves me one ticket, it's good. I can, I can do this. So I went and got one. I, I was like the top of the, model, top of the line one I, I got at that point in time. And I was so excited until I got caught again. <laughs> and then I went online and I researched and I realized, oh, my radar detector is now out of date. I have to go buy another one. And this... I, of course, I couldn't afford to buy another one. I was a student and I said, forget this. And um, this race of the radar detector ma manufacturers versus the police making their radars undetectable was what I was facing and, and what I was learning. 
I tell you that story because that's literally what SEO is. If you think about what you're trying to do or what as a business owner we're trying to do is we're trying to manipulate search results. We're trying to manipulate what shows up on the first page of Google. So it is a race between Google engineers versus some other people calling themselves SEO experts. Let me just stop right there. Who do you think is gonna win? Google is gonna win every single time because they have the resources, they have better engineers and someone who has the capability to be at the level of a Google engineer would never go and do SEO. They would probably go get hired by Google in, in majority of cases. So this is the issue that most business owners do not think about, do not always understand. We are not gonna be successful, at least not for long, if we're trying to cheat our way into showing up on the first page of Google. There's a proper way of doing it. I'm not saying it's impossible to do. There's a proper way of doing it. And there used to be, used to be many years ago, effective ways of doing it, where if you had enough money, and I'll go over that stuff today, if you had enough money, you would be able to do that. Over a, over a given period of time. So I want that to sink, right? We're not trying to trick Google here. We're not, there's nothing we're gonna do today or talk about or anybody who comes to you and says, I guarantee that within, this, like within, I don't know, six months or something, you're gonna be on the page of Google, depending on your competition, they probably are not telling you the truth, right? So in some, in some fields that might work, I'm not saying that that, that, that is always uh, uh, a scam, but most of the time it is. Like if you're, if you're a real estate agent, for example, and somebody tells you, give me $10,000, I'll work on your website for six months and I'll rank you number one on Google, it's not gonna happen. I guarantee you that's not gonna happen. Insurance brokers, same thing. If there, is a, if there is competition, there's no way that's gonna happen. That there are ways that you can do that and you can grow your business using the search engine. And hopefully today we'll touch, about, touch, touch on that a little bit. Um, but but that, that big idea of search engine optimization will result in immediate business is not true. Most of the time it's not true. All right, so, so what can we do then? Right, what, what, are, what are we able to do? So search and the, the, the term search engine optimization basically means optimizing your website for the search engines. So giving the search engines the ability to understand what your website is, to understand what you have to offer, to understand what the content that there is on your, what content is there on your website so that when a search, when, when a search comes up, somebody is searching for that information, Google and other search engines for that matter know what it is that you have so they can serve it appropriately, appropri appropriately to the viewer. Search engines for the longest time have used a ranking system to decide what pages are more important than other pages. This is, so this is level two, right? Level one is, you tell you as a business owner, as a website, as a webmaster, let's say, you tell the search engines what your website is about, what each page is about, what a web page is about, right? And then the next level up is Google. If you were in charge of that, right, you are tasked to rank those results, right? So imagine if you're a librarian, for example, or if you have, if you have a bunch of books at, at, at home, and somebody comes to you and says, I want a book on uh, whatever, right, on fitness. You may have 10 books at home that are on fitness. In your mind, because you're familiar with those books, you start to rank them, right? And then you tell the person, here, read this one first. And then if you don't find what you're looking for, go read the second one and the third one and the fourth one, right? Google is tasked with that. So if you're working at Google, Google is tasked to serve results based on a certain ranking, right? Now it's the question of what mechanism, what algorithm they base th that ranking on, that is the, the, the big question, the million dollar question, right? It's for, for a, lot of, a lot of times, 
people build their business around a certain algorithm that Google has, and then Google goes and changes the algorithm. And then they get tanked. Basically, their result goes at the bottom of the page 15, for example, right? From, from page one to page 15. And I know, I've, I know, personally know people who've lost a lot of money because of that, because they end up going from page number one to somewhere that they cannot be found. It's because, as I said before, Google is continuously trying to weed out things that are not being done properly, things that are not being done organically. So if they realize that somebody is manipulating results, they do what they can in order for that person not to rank. All right, so let's talk about these, these two different things. Number one was the introduction, right? How do we introduce our web page or website to Google? This, the very basic of this happens to happens on in a category that we call on-page optimization, right? So on-page optimization means things that are fully in your control. These are things that you have the ability to do on your website, okay? All right, so let me, I'm gonna share my screen here. So first, let's look at a Google search results page, right? So let's do Toastmasters, for example. If I can spell, Toast, okay. All right, so this is a Google search results page. And if we scroll through this, you'll see a variety of different types of results. You, this keeps changing. It, it, it hasn't always been like this. If you go back and look at Google search results previously from two, three years ago, you see different types of results. Depending on the words that you search for, the search term that you, you search, you get different types of results. So right now, what we're seeing is multiple entries. These are multiple results. So log in, find the club about Toastmasters, how to join. All of this is multiple entries for toastmasters.org. So Google is saying, hey, I know toastmasters.org is pretty important. I know based on my statistics that a lot of people who search for this end up clicking on these particular things. They end up going to these links. So login, how to join, all this stuff. Next, if you scroll down, because of the type of keyword that I've searched for, you see map results, all right? So now map results, I don't remember if I have, I think I have a specific session just on map results, but um, just so we, we pay attention to this for almost everybody that's on this call, map results are where the gold mine is. Right. If you want to do any search engine optimization, that's where your focus should be. And that's why I thought about doing a, a session completely on map results, whether you're dealing with a Toastmasters club or a small business map results. Why is map results significant? Because it is geographically selected for you. Right. So your computer or your phone knows where you are based on location and it's giving you results that are that are relevant right so i happen to be in maple ridge right now so you can see it's giving me positively speaking toastmasters which is in, to in in maple ridge they meet at haney place mall you can see this it's pretty close to me right then it's coquitlam and port coquitlam right so by 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 distance but there are there are a number of clubs that are in this vicinity that are not showing up right and that's that's what we want to try and focus on when we talk about the Google map results later in, in that other um, session that we have. And then here, it's actually giving me the entry for the website for positively speaking Toastmasters that's in Maple Ridge, right? And it's giving me some key questions. This is what I meant. Like if you came here and, and did this for Toastmasters, probably a year ago, you would not see these results. They keep changing things. Things are different. The other things are, you see how my picture shows up up here in the right-hand corner? These are personalized results based on my search history, based on my preferences. They are not global results, okay? If I wanna see what global results are, I need to log in from an incognito window, probably turn off my location and then search. And that would be closer to a global search results. So 
that what you what you search on your computer and you can try this right now if you want i would say 90 percent is different than what i'm seeing right i'm not going to say 100 percent because things might be very similar but it's not it's probably not exactly like uh what i'm what i'm looking at then we see blue hair on which is another Toastmasters very close to where I am, right? But it's interesting, they didn't show up in Google Maps, right? So somehow Google doesn't think they're important enough to be up here, but it's giving me the results down here. I, I'm getting a bunch of Twitter results. I'm getting a bunch of videos. And then there's the encyclopedia page for Toastmasters, right? So. The, one of the things you want to do when you get started with this is you want to do your market research. Uh, one of the pieces of the market research is to do just this. Start searching for, for the keywords. This, this is a keyword, okay? So the, the search term is a keyword. And as soon as I type this in, you see all these other ones that are coming up. Google is basically saying, based on my search history, these are relevant to the search that you did. So it's trying to help me to understand, um, to, to, to narrow down my search. Okay, so let's go back up. I want to share, so actually I can do it right here. So look at, let me see what blue hair on had. Maybe that's better. Yeah, so right here, let's, let's kind of analyze this really quickly. We have the URL showing at the very top. And then right below, we have this blue hyperlink, right? So you, you can click on it. And then you have this description where it says, we are a Toastmaster club, right? So this is important to look at. I want you to think about this as an ad, right? Because basically we want someone to click on this, right? When someone looks at our search results, what's the next thing we're asking them to do? We're asking them to click on this. What, well, whether they click on that number one spot or they click on this down here could have to do with the copywriting, right? Could have to do with what you have written as what shows up on online as this um, hyperlink and then the description. That's why I'm, what I'm saying is try and look at it as an ad. So you've got, um, the, you've got this up here, which is the title, right? And then you've got a description down here. So how do we change these? Are we able to manipulate these? That should be the next question that, that you're asking yourself. And the answer is yes. The way we do that is called through, they're called meta tags. Okay, so this is a meta tag. It's a meta title tag. And this is a meta description tag. So if you don't like what you see for your business on the, on the search results page, you got to go and change your meta tags. And since we've been talking about WordPress all along since the beginning of, of these sessions, I'm going to tell you how to do that in WordPress really quickly, but in any platform, regardless of what your platform is, they all allow you to edit your meta tags. Even if you have somebody else build your website, those are things that you should be telling them. You should be asking them or they ask you what you want to put on there so that you can do it. There are certain character limits for these ones. The reason you're seeing this run out here, it says pit dot 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 is because whoever wrote this wasn't cognizant of the character limit. Same thing down here. You see it ends in dot dot dot. It's because they went over the character limit, whatever the character limit is. And I don't have the character limit memorized because if you go over to one of my WordPress installations here, you will see that this is a this is a post. You remember, if you guys that have been with me or are familiar with WordPress in general, we talked about two ways of public publishing in WordPress. One's a post and one's a page. Regardless of whether you're on a post or a page, you have the same things happening. Um, so the title tag goes, the, the, the title of the page goes in here. This is not the title tag. Okay, this is the title of, of the page. If you do not do anything, this will show up as your title tag. Okay, so if you don't tell the search engine what your actual title tag is, it will grab it from the title of the post. Same thing with description. If you do not tell 
the search engine what the description is, what your meta description tag is, it is going to just select as much as is suitable from the top lines of your post. And that will show up on the search engine. Obviously, you don't want that. So there are a variety of plugins that you can use in WordPress that allow you, that make it easier for you to deal with, with these tags. Uh, one of my favorites is called Yoast SEO. You can, it, it's free. You can install that and you can use it. So I'm not going to go over it. There's, there's a lot of um, like how to that you can read on Yoast. It's, it's very easy to use. I recommend you, you do that on your own. Um, but basically, if you come down here, okay, so your, your, hold on, it's, it's going to grab the information for you and put it in here. The, the, it's going to show you what it's going to look like, right? So as you type it in, it's going to show you that snippet is going to show you, pre, snippet preview is going to show you what it looks like. Right here, the desktop version and the, the mobile version will also tell you what each one of those will look like. Here, if you indicate what keywords you've used, and we're gonna go over keywords really uh, briefly here as well, it's gonna tell you if you're doing a good job or not, right? Now, if you've done your own keywords research, which you should do before targeting anything, and that goes back to the question that Janice asked me at the beginning of this, um, this session as well, you, this stuff makes sense. Otherwise they don't make sense. I don't always use this, but what I do, what I do is I use it mostly if I want something very specific. If you look at the social um, tab here, you look at Facebook, Facebook title, Facebook description, even Facebook image, because again, if you don't have this stuff specifically in there, this is in a case where you want in a scenario where you want the, the data that comes up differently on a search engine versus on, uh, on Facebook versus on Twitter. So you have the ability to change those right here. Okay, so enough about that. But basically what I want you to remember is you want to have your title tag, a meta title tag and meta description tag intentionally selected. You don't want it to randomly come up um, and you want it to be readable as well. So there, there has to be a balance between the keywords you put in there, the keywords, and we're going to discuss keywords really quickly here, but uh, in, in a minute, but there has to be a balance between the keywords that you're putting in those spaces and the title and description being readable. It's, it should be written for a human being, but satisfy a search engine. And things are getting better, right? Our, that, that balance, the, the way the search engines work, that's getting better and better. Okay, so let's go over here. So this is a tool that, uh, this is a tool that Google has. Let me try to refresh it. Uh, if you search for Google keyword tool, you should get something. I don't know why this is not working. Um, I had it up just now, but there we go, okay. So based on, cert this is a part of Google AdWords, but you can use it for free. So Google AdWords is the platform that Google has for advertising. You can come here, you don't know what, what keywords to use, right? You have some ideas. You don't know what Google, what keywords to use because you don't know what the search volume is. This is kind of a, it's, it's, it's a bit of a supply and demand uh, discussion here, right? So your website, your content is the supply. The demand is how often people search for something, right? So how often people search for something is the demand versus the supply. How many websites, how many web pages do we have out there that have that content? So that balance, the more people have it out there means the more competition you have. And if you have not enough people searching for it, then you're not target, targeting the right keywords either. I hope that makes sense. I know that that didn't, that didn't sound too good, but um, so let's, let's start here. Discover new keywords. So I'm just gonna, again, put in Toastmasters. 
So the idea here is I'm saying if somebody's searching for Toastmasters, what other keywords do people search for, right? Okay. So you can see, is it gonna let me, uh, come on, there we go. Okay, so you have Toastmasters near me, Toastmasters club, Toastmasters club near me, Toastmasters table topics, Toastmasters locations, easy speak Toastmasters. This is all familiar to us, right? We know why people search for these things, if you think about it a little bit at least. So uh, you, you can get an idea of what is being searched for. Over here, it says average monthly searches, right? So this is, this is what we were talking about in terms of demand. Competition is the supply, right? So how much stuff do we have out there? How much, um, how many web pages do we have out there? The rest of it, I wouldn't worry about at the moment. They have to do with advertising, right? But you have the ability to click on these and it will sort it for you, okay? So you can see if I was to do something here with, with these keywords, we can see that Toastmasters near me is a pretty good keyword to go after. But guess what? When you do Toastmasters near me, map results are going to show up. And that's why I was saying this, it's a good idea to focus on map results. You don't want to do a keyword targeted activity on your web website for Toastmasters near me. That does not make any sense, right? However, if you go down where it says Toastmasters table topics, that might be interesting, right? Because there are enough people searching for it and the supply is low, right? So if I had to bet here, I would say I would, if I wanted to do um, content, I would do content around table topics because it seems like a lot of people are looking for table topics. If we keep going, none of it is stuff that we can really do anything about in terms of content. You got clubs near me, locations, Toastmasters. Again, all this stuff is Toastmasters dashboards. Nothing that you could develop content around. The table topic one is, and I bet you what it is, I'm just guessing, is probably various table topic masters trying to find table topics to be prepared for the meeting. I, that's my guess. I'm not sure, right? So somebody goes online and says, hey, I'm the table topic this week. What am I going to do? What are some questions that I can ask? I suspect that's what that means, but you would really need to do a bunch of testing to see if, if that's true or not. But basically, when someone sits down and thinks about how am I gonna optimize well, my website, you should have five to seven top keywords that you're gonna target your, your web pages around those. And then each one of those will have other keywords as well. There is something that's called the long tail keyword. And let me explain that really quickly here. If I want to purchase a digital camera, if I go in and I just type in digital camera, I'm gonna get a ton of results, right? All kinds of stuff. And if I'm the, if the, if I'm the person selling the digital camera, it is gonna be next to impossible for me to rank for digital camera, just digital camera in general. However, if I set my keywords to be the exact make and model of that camera. So for example, I say Nikon 450, whatever it is. I, 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 don't, I don't know the terminology, right? Whatever those terms are to be exactly specifically the camera that I'm selling the chances of me ranking for that, for that, that, that chain of keywords, which is called the long tail, because it has a long tail, right? It's a, it's a bunch of words. The chances of me ranking for that is a lot higher because now the number of websites that are, that are out there are probably lower and the people who are searching for that are probably more ready to make a purchase right? So that's why the long tail is important. So what I was saying and what led me to that, to the long tail is you, you start with five to seven keywords that are important and you do it based on the, the search volume to figure out what it is that you're going after. And then 
off of those, you want to figure out what your long tail is. So once you figured out what your long tail is, your long tail is what you you end up using in your blog posts, on your pages, on all of those those things that I just said that you you want to optimize for. So your your keywords end up going. Th these are the keywords that would end up going into your title tag and your meta description tag. If you don't know what those keywords are ahead of time, you have a number of issues. Number one, it's gonna be difficult to know what type of content, content would be beneficial for you as you're developing content, if you're only thinking about it in terms of SEO. Number two, once you've written your thing or how you write your thing might be a little bit different based on the, the keywords that you have, right? And so as I said before, and I repeat this, you should focus on writing for a human being, but with the understanding that the search engine is reading this as well. So every search engine has something that's called a bot. So you have the Google bot, for example, and they, yes, crawl your website. Okay, as creepy as that sounds, but that's exactly what they do. They crawl the website. Now that leads me to the next to the next topic here that's very important and it kind of goes to that next concept of remember I said we have on page activity that we do the next concept that's important is off page and traditionally 80% of your SEO results has to do with off page okay so what we just talked about up until now is maybe 20% of, of where the results come from. Come from. The 80% is off page. It's what happens outside of your website. And it goes back to the conversation we had or the discussion we had about how Google ranks these results. It is almost like a voting system, right? It's like how many other websites are saying that this page is important? Okay, and they vote for that page by through hyperlinks, through links that reside on other websites. So let me give you some examples. So if I am, if I am, if I have a web page and in my content, I link to another site, right? If I link to toastmasters.org, for example, as a resource, I am that web page is saying one vote for toastmasters.org. It's saying that reference is important. If there are thousands of those pages, so when, when I'm comparing, if everything else is equal, if one page has a thousand votes versus another page that has 2000 votes, if everything else is equal, the page with 2000 votes wins, which means it ranks higher, okay? So that's why, that's the reason when you sit down with one of these SEO experts, or if someone, if you're reading their price plans and stuff, they'll tell you, we'll give you this many backlinks. We'll sell you 2000 backlinks for a for hundred bucks. We'll give you 2000 back backlinks for a hundred bucks a month. We'll give it to you every month, right? This is, this is if, if, you, if anybody comes and talks to you about backlinks, that's what that means, okay? So they're going, on random blogs and, and other places, creating links to your website. All right, now your, uh, your antennas should be going off right now based off what I had told you before going, huh, wait a minute, well, what do you mean? What's going on here? I'm not really voting for that website when I'm buying those links, am I? I'm paying for some web pages to say, hey, this guy is important. And that's what I was talking about before when I told you about the story of the the radar detector and the, and the police, right? It's this competition of the search engine, uh, the engineers at, at the search engine companies figuring out how people are manipulating the results and that's result manipulation, right? So I probably about like 10, 15 years ago, it was very easy. You could manipulate search result, results very, very easily. And people used to even do jokes on this, like, I don't want to actually mention what it was, but people had, you know, a, a search term. This is during the Bush era. They had a search term um, targeted to bring up the White House website, right? And it was completely irrelevant, but they did it because there was a lot of backlinks and those backlinks made that phrase rank higher than anything else. When you search for that phrase, the, the, the White House website came up. 
right? So I hope that's starting to make sense a little bit. Um, so, on the, so, so basically what I'm, what I'm saying is you, if there are things that happen outside of your web, website that have a very great impact on how your website ranks, and that's through linking, right? Through people hyperlinking to your web pages. Now, Google gives you a tool to look and see who is linking to you. Because if this is so important, if they don't give us a way to check and see who is linking to me, I have no way of saying, like, maybe somebody hates me and they go off and start linking to my website from all these spammy sites. Because that's what Google does. If there's a thing, there's a term called the Google slap. And what that means is they'll figure out that you're getting a bunch of links from spammy websites and they, they take your ranking away right? They basically ban your, your domain name. And once your domain name is banned, you have to go undo all of those links in order to get, get it back. And I've had clients that have been in that position. My recommendation has been, if you don't have a lot of material that has that URL on there, you're better off changing your URL because it's very, very difficult trying to go find all of those links and take the link off. Finding the links is not hard. Google tells you, and I'll show you where you can see that. But going into those sites and editing those pages to get rid of those hyperlinks is next to impossible because you don't, a lot of times you don't have the accounts. So how are you going to do that, right? So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's a very, very tall order. So there is a tool called Google Webmaster Tool. And again, this is free. All of these are free. Um, so what you can do is you can, of course, this isn't, uh, so let me just go back, take a step back. Google Webmaster Tools exists as a tool. However, you have to go through the installation process with your website to be able to take advantage of it, right? So there is, is it isn't like today after this, you go and find your Google Webmaster Tool, you go in there and there is nothing there, right? There has to be, the code has to be installed on every single page of your website. And that's when Google has the ability to pull the information. There, is, there are a variety of really, really cool tools in Webmaster Tools that you can go take a look at, play with. But I want to draw your attention to this particular thing that we're talking about here. And over the years, Google Webmaster Tools has gotten better and more complicated, but there are all kinds of video tutorials and everything that you can read up on all of this stuff that I'm telling you about today. So if you go to this section that says links down here on the left, if I click on that. All right, so what it's telling me here, just really quickly, if you look, it says external links, that means going outgoing links, right? Internal links and top linking sites. So this is what I was talking about. So this particular website, um, this particular website that I'm, that I'm looking at the webmaster tools for is linked by 1338 web pages so there are that many links to this website and then you can look at it right it says this particular website has linked it has linked to 355 pages of my website and targeting four pages. Let me see if I can click on these. Yeah, so it's telling me where they've linked to. Okay, so now you see how, why I say it's difficult because I don't own this website. If I wanna remove some of these links, it's, th th this page has been linked to 242 times. I don't own this website, if I wanted to remove it, I'd have to contact the owner of this website and then start negotiating with them, I guess, to figure out how they're gonna remove the link off of their website. Like I said, it's next to impossible, right? But here you have the ability to, to scroll down on these and see um, who's linking to you, right? And there's more, like there's, you know, I can click on the next page and go, go dig into more. 
right? So that's, I know this is a, especially if this is the very first time you're hearing this, this is a, might be a difficult concept to grasp. There's a lot there, but I want you to understand that the biggest, I guess the biggest takeaway from this segment is if somebody is telling you that I'm going to make your website rank high and you ask them, okay, how are you going to do that? And they'll tell you, well, let me introduce, let me tell you what the plan is. And a part of that plan is link building. That's the, that's the, 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 the term that's used, link building. You should start to question. You should start to be alarmed as, as to, okay, well, where, what, are, what are the websites that are linking to me? How is this happening? Um, why, you know, what, what is the context here of what you're doing? And most of the time when you start asking those questions, the consultants will walk away because they, they'll understand that you're not the right, you're not the right target. You're, you're a difficult customer to deal with because you're asking them smart questions. Um, there are companies that do this legitimately, but it takes a lot of work. And I suspect it would cost you a lot of money to do that. It's not a hundred bucks a month thing. It would take actual work to do. Now the question that's coming up and I, and I want to spend, after the break, I want to spend more time talking about this because I think what I've done here is I've basically presented a problem more than anything. I haven't even really given you a solution. Would you agree with that? I don't know. I'm, I'm basically telling you what not to do here. But the question, if I was in your shoes, I'd say, well, what do you want me to do then? Right? Like, are you telling me that this is all useless? And the the, 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 the short answer to that and where, where I want to spend the time working after this is audience building. That's the short, short answer to that. Why? How does audience build, building relate to SEO? If you put cool content up on your web page, if you put useful content up on your web page, if you put life changing content up on your web page, the reader has a tendency to share that content because they, they're impressed by it, because they found it useful, because they, it changed their life. Every time they share your content, the user is creating a link to your website, right? Let me repeat that. Every time they share your content, whether they tweet it, they share it on Facebook, however they share it, they are creating a hyperlink to your website. If you look at a tweet, a tweet by itself has a link, right? There's a, the, the tweet has a link that you can go to. And if they, so that's a web page on its own. And if they have your URL on their tweet, they're linking back from that web page to your URL. Hopefully that made sense. So if you have a thousand people who trust you, who love you, and you put up a, you know, a, a, a blog post that's really cool content, they read it and they're impressed by it. If those, let's say half of those people tweet that URL that you build to your blog, you all of a sudden have 500 backlinks with one push, right? So we've, we've talked a little bit about last week, we were talking, not last week, sorry, last month we were talking about uh, lead generation and autoresponders and, and, and things like that. And I told you, I think we have a session on email marketing. That's why those things are so important. At least in my philosophy of digital marketing, my, my philosophy is around audience building, around building trust, around building relationships, around doing this long-term, not showing up and paying somebody a bunch of money to build some backlinks for you and then having it disappear in a few months or as soon as Google changes their algorithm. So if you've got your leads and you're doing email campaigns to them, when you write your blog, who's the first person you're gonna tell? It's your audience. You're gonna send them an email and say, check out this thing I just wrote. And then you, you can even tell them, hey, if, if you find this interesting, could you share it? And when they share it, you've got that backlink. And over time, those backlinks add up. More and more and more of those ad links will add up. And that will give you the authority that you're looking for over other web pages. I think I'm gonna stop there. So let me stop sharing. 
maybe we can take one or two questions until we have read. Uh, Yuri, are you around? Yes, I am around and I was hiding from you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I said. They, there is um, one thing I know you're going to be talking that when you do the Google map. Is is it geographically constrained when you do the search on Google? Um, yes and no. Okay, so yes, it is. If you are, you you can put a geo tag in there, right? So I can say mm -hmm. Toastmasters Maple Ridge. Right. So yeah. if I'm not in Maple Ridge, if I'm sitting on the North Shore and I want to look for Toastmasters clubs in Maple Ridge, then I put a geotag in there. I say Toastmasters Maple Ridge and that will constrain constraint it by Maple Ridge, by that area. Right. Whereas if I happen to physically be here and the, cert, the device that I'm on knows my location, therefore Google knows, knows my location, then it's automatically done. Hopefully that answers that. Um, I think so. Are you guys still seeing my screen? Yeah. No, I don't. Okay, good. Okay. All right. What's the next question? I think we have a. I don't. I think uh, the other two was uh, Lily asked if uh, why they were not on on the. Oh no, Sandra. Sorry. Sandra asked, maybe, oh, maybe they are not in Google, which is related to Lily's question, which is why a Blue Heron is not there. Mm, I see, okay. So yeah, I, I, I think I heard uh, like a donut was the one uh, putting the yeah. something on Google Map. Yeah, yeah, the, the, it is very possible that they don't, they haven't claimed their Google Maps entry. That was kind of a rhetorical question. There, there are a lot of reasons we can dig in and see why they're not there, but most likely the, the reason is that they, they don't mm -hmm. have their Google entry claimed. Exactly. So hello everybody again. Um, so yeah, I told you what not to do. Let's talk about what we should do. The plan, like I've told you before, is to put in, in previous sessions is to put sort of a profile of what your perfect customer is. I call it a customer avatar and I promise you that I will try to do one of these sessions just on that. Um, I, I don't think it's in the plans right now, in the, in the, the schedule that, that we've decided on and provided, but um, that's something that we will need to work on. But that customer profile defines, that customer avatar defines who this person is and it should give you an idea of what they would be searching for. Based on that and the use of keyword research tools, you should come up with a number of keywords. You should come up with a number of primary keywords. So I would suggest five to seven primary keywords. And then each one of those keywords can break down to maybe two or three other keywords. So you have a bigger set of secondary keywords and then you have the long tail, like I explained to you before, I told you what long tail was. So once you have that, those set of keywords in front of you, when we, when we, there's a, again, another session that we're going to do on content generation, content creation strategies. When we talk about that, I will bring this back up again, because this is something that you need to have. When you start to create content, your content is going to be human focused. Okay. Don't get me wrong. I, I am, I will never tell you to create content for the search engine. That is not the way, the way I think is, is proper way of doing business. So you create the content for a person, you create the content for that client that we just talked about. However, you need to sprinkle it with those keywords, okay? So you need to start using those keywords that, that, that we just talked about. So the search engine knows where, uh, that, that this content is related to what we're talking about, to, to the topic that the person is searching for. And then your, make sure your title tag and description tag are correct, that they carry the keywords and also they're written for humans. So this content is created. Right? Based on what we just talked about, your content is created. There is, I want you just to just write this down and then go look it up later. I'll tell you what it is, but I want you to be cognizant of this. There's a file 
called robot.txt. Okay, it's a robot, like robot, normal robot.txt that resides on a web server on the web, like when you have your website, that, that's one of the files that's on that website. This file is specifically written for a search engine bot. Okay, and all it does is it tells the bot where to go and where not to go. Okay, so actually it tells, tells, tells it mainly where not to go. There's another mechanism that's called a sitemap and different, different websites have a different, different ways of hosting this, but you upload a sitemap basically. Either your, your webmaster can help you with that, or again, you can look up how to do this. These things are not hard. They're very, very easy to do. Like the, the robot.txt file, txt file basically says, for example, disallow slash, and then you give it the, the names of the pages that you don't want it to go on. So what are some examples of things that you don't want the search, en the, the, the search engine bot to go on? If you, for example, have a duplicate of one page, right? You have one page that you cannot, for whatever reason, you cannot delete one of them, but you have two that are almost identical, maybe not exactly identical, but they're almost identical. You want to disallow the bot to go to one of those pages because otherwise Google thinks you have duplicate content and that's a negative point towards the reputation of your website. Okay, Google has things that they look at in terms of um, like a, a brownie point, if you will, for your website. And then they have negative points as well. One of the brownie points is fresh content. So they like to see new content. Google is a search engine. So the more information, the more content that we're giving it, the happier it is. So you'll see when we talk about Google Maps, it's all about the amount of content that we put in. We'll, we'll review that when we get there. But for this, you want to have a publication strategy, that content strategy that we, we will talk about. You want to publish, let's say, every couple of months, uh, every, every month, every week. However, with whatever, the more frequent, the better, because Google likes the fresh content. There are little tweaks and tricks that you can do that people will teach these things on their search engine optimization for X, search engine optimization for Y. So for example, I'll give you one example um, just so you, can, so you can use it. When you upload a YouTube video, the description of that video, if you use the URL of the website in one of the top line, in one of the, the first line, for example, in one of the first sentences of the description of the video, that counts as um, a, a backlink, right? So if you look at the backlink of your website, you'll see the URL of a YouTube video in there. And then because it's YouTube, that website has high authority. Authority. And I didn't mention this before. I'm going to mention it now. It slipped my mind. The two, two backlinks are not necessarily created equally. Okay. So uh, the backlinks to a website have different weights in terms of, um, in terms of authority, right? Think of it as if you're not feeling well and you go to a doctor and a doctor tells you to take some sort of medication, versus you go to your friend who's a gardener and tells you to take a certain me medication, who are you more likely to listen to? Hopefully the doctor, right? And that it's the same thing. Those, those, those two links, if one of them comes from a website that has zero authority whatsoever versus the another one that comes from like, let's say a .gov website or a .edu website, which are websites that, are, that have clout, that are, that are important, the ones, the, the links that come from those websites way more. So you might have 50 links from your friend's website and it doesn't weigh as much as one link from um, the UBC website, for example, right? So when you have a link that's coming from YouTube, the domain youtube.com, that's an important link and you have the opportunity to do that. So why not do it? Same is true when it's coming from Twitter. And that's why I said, if you tweet your, your URL out and somebody else retweets it or decides to repost it in some shape or form, you're gaining a lot more 
than if you paid somebody who doesn't have a strong website to put a backlink on there for you. So let's go back to the steps that we were talking about. You want to identify your keywords and then keep them in mind as you're creating your content. Once you have your content, you want to start sharing it. Now it's important that that content is top-notch content. As I've said before, you want to give your best content. And that's a discussion that we'll leave for our, for our content creation strategy. That's one of the most difficult things for a small business owner to grasp that I'm giving away my best content, but that's what actually works. So once you have this content and you start sharing it with people, you start to gain more and more. I don't want to use the term followers because it's the incorrect term in, in my opinion, you're going to start to attract more and more people into your inner circle online. Right? So these could be, complete strangers that remember referring back to the last session that we did that put their, hand, put their hand up and say, hey, can you help me? I'm interested, right? They became a lead. Remember, we talked about that. They filled out a form, they opted in, and now they're in your database. What does that mean? That means you have the ability to email them, okay? So when you're sending that email, you, if you've developed that relationship with those people, you will see a spike in traffic to that certain web page that, you, that you're sending people to. You will see the traffic to that web page all of a sudden go up. All right, how do we know if that traffic is going up and down? I'm about to share my screen. Okay, so introducing another tool. This is the Google Analytics tool. Again, another free tool provided by Google. This one allows us to measure traffic. Now, depending on how much of a geek you are, you, may, you might end up spending days on this thing and go crazy, right? Because this is for someone like me who's loves data, digging into things and seeing what works, what doesn't work. This is heaven, right? There is just so much information in here and it keeps getting better and better. A caveat here for you that threw me off for a very long time. Google is not very honest with their numbers. So when you, when you start to advertise with them, they became, become a little bit more honest, but they're still not 100% honest and they even admit this, right? So they, they won't tell you exactly what's going on on your website. They won't tell you exactly who your visitor is. They won't tell you how many people are doing what on your website, but they give you an idea. And, and we should be happy about that, right? We should be happy that they're at least giving us an idea of, of what's happening on their website. I'm going to go over some little things here to just give you a taste of what this thing is like. For those of you who feel excited after I show you these things, you've got your work cut out for you because there's a lot of tutorials and whatnot that you can go through. Of course, it starts out by installing this on your website. Again, it's a little snippet of code. If you, you, if you are using WordPress, it's very simple. You just take the, a little key. I think it's like a eight, alpha, eight digit alphanumeric key or something like that that you put into a field and it will automatically copy it to all of your pages for you. Basically, that code needs to reside on every page of your website so that Google can track what's happening on your website. One of the very cool things that I don't think you'll see uh, the results for today because of the website I'm sharing is real-time traffic. So if I click on this, go to overview, it's gonna show me who is currently on the website, like right now as we're speaking. It says zero because there is nobody on the website. That's why I said this is probably not gonna work very well. But if someone goes on that website, this jumps up to one, right? So actually, let me see if I can, if I come here. Go for something else. Because this is the website. So, but, but I'm on the back end of it. I don't know if it'll recognize it or not. I'll go back here, give it a minute. All right, I don't know. We'll see if it pops up or not. But this will show you 
everything that's happening right this is live right so if you're running a live event for example and you're there you go you see that one just jumped up that's me and if we look at the 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 location here you can see oh it says west vancouver that's not me i don't know who it is <laughs> that's somebody <me. laughs> is that you okay there you go mariam just jumped on there all right so, so you can see it shows it right away right and then it's if it was actually search based, you would see the keyword here. It says not provided, right? Again, not provided a lot of times also means, hey, I'm Google, I'm big, I don't have to tell you anything, right? So a lot of times that's also, that's also a factor. But under real time, you can click on locations, right? And it says Canada, I can click on Canada, drill down, and it will tell me that it's in West Vancouver, right? Um, traffic sources, this was direct traffic, I assume. And she probably just typed it in. Google, right? Did you did you search for it, Maria? Yes, I did. Yeah, so she 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 searched for it. She put it in the in the in the Google bar and then came up, hit on it, organic. That's why it says organic. Content, it shows which page she's on right now. So she's on the main page, that means home page, right? If she can you if you're still on there, Mariam, can you click on a different page so we can see this change and um, we'll see if if it actually shows that. But you can see how many people are actively on what pages of your website. This is helpful if you're doing live events, right? If you're doing something live and you want to see what's happening to your traffic right right there and then, and you're making decisions based on what the traffic is doing on your, see, she went on the tickets page right now. You see that? It changed. So this is live telling us what the visitor is doing on the website. Events and conversions, and see, she went to BFL 66. Right, so, so you can see that it's, it's doing that live. I find that very cool. I don't know about you guys, but. <laughs> and then um, for events and conversions, that's stuff that you have to program in there, right? So a conversion means, did somebody go and actually purchase a ticket, for example, right? And that would count as, as a conversion. Let's go down here and look at behavior. Again, you have overview, right? So this is an overview of everything. Here you have a, a, a timeline, right? September 26th to October 22nd. So it's giving me whatever, a week, right? And you can see, you know, we had 87 on 87 hits on September 29th. You might want to analyze and see, you know, what happened? Did something happen on September 29th? Did we share a link on Instagram or something and cause this to spike? What actually happened? And for us to see what happened, we may be able to go to that day. So this is, I mean, I don't know if we need to go into this level of, um, drill down right now to show you guys, but you could select just that day here from the calendar, right? And then go see which page was the most popular. And then based on that, you may be able to figure out what traffic strategy caused this. Was it social media? Was it your email campaign, right? So the district, for example, sends out the newsletter, right? And then they want to see, hey, which one of these, the stuff that we, we shared was cool? What did they find interesting, right? They can go to, to, to this page on uh, for D96 website and look at the content, right? What links had a spike in traffic on the day where we shot, where we sent the email blast out, right? Because you can see we sent the email to whatever, 500 people, right? Then you look and you go, okay, out of those 500 people, 400 of them opened the email. And right there in, in whatever autoresponder tool that we're using, uh, MailChimp, for example, we can see that 200 people clicked on the link. They clicked on the newsletter link, right? And then on the website. And then we can, we, we can see that it should correspond almost exactly to what you see in Google Analytics. And then from there, you should have the ability to 
you should have the ability to see what else they did on the website. And you would be able to tell that, hey, this audience seems to be interested in workshops, for example, because that's what's attracting their attention. Then the marketing strategy from that point onwards would be let's focus more on workshops, right? Or let's say alternatively, we'll see that people are more interested to learn about the awards night that we're promoting right now, right? So they go to awards night, the, then the district can sit down and go, look, listen, we have all these workshops. Nobody's interested to find out what they are, but the award night, everybody's fired up. Maybe we should do more celebratory type events. Do you see what I'm saying? So the, 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 the traffic pattern tells you what to do. It gives you data-driven strategies on how to approach an audience. And when I say, when I use the term audience building, what I mean is you cater your content to what your audience is voting for, what your audience is wanting from you versus what you want, what I want, right? That's the difference because the way I look at it, my philosophy is I am at the service of my audience, not the other way around. So if I'm at the service of my audience, my audience decides what it is that I want to give, that, that they want me to give them. So I provide that for them. So let me just dig in a little bit more here. Site content, if I go to all pages. There you go, and I scroll down again. Remember, this is only for this period. Let me just change this period real quick so we can see. Let's do last 30 days. So almost the entire month of September. First of all, you guys can see on September 15th, something happened. See that everything is kind of the same. You know, we, we've gradually grown from here and we're gradually kind of, if you, if you wanna draw one line, you can see that it's gradually growing, but on September 15th, we had a spike, right? So it's, I would, if I was analyzing this data, I'd be curious what happened on September 15th. We probably shared some sort of news or something. But then you can see also, this is the content, right? You can see that these pages had the hits, and then you can see the, the, various, um, the various information that they're giving you. So you're giving you page views, average time on page, which is important in my opinion, right? So. If, if, if you drove traffic to an article and they spent 15 seconds on it, they probably didn't really look at it. Whereas you can see this other page right here, it's four and a half minutes on that page. So they really interacted with that page, right? Do you see, you see, you see how what's happening there? Um, and then you've got landing pages, you've got exit pages, you've got content drill down, which I just clicked on. Okay, so this is where things start to get a little bit more difficult, right? So it, it's basically saying uh, page path level one, and then you can add a secondary dimension to it, which is you know sorting it by like, what is, you wanna look at this page, but you wanna look at it by the source of traffic, for example, as well as that. So I don't wanna go into these things because they're gonna, they take a little bit more time to, um, to explain. What I wanted to do was overall introduce you to, to, this, um, to this tool so you can dig in and see what in general is happening. Um, clicked on audience, you have a bunch of different things in here that are, that are also interesting that you can look at. Um, let's quickly look at the geo tab. It gives you language and location. If I go by location, Again, should be the period for the month of September. I scroll up here. Yep, it's the period of um, almost the entire month of September. And here, by a color gradient, gradient, it's telling you where most of the traffic came from. You know, it's kind of, most of it is obvious, not all of it. And then here, you can see by country where they came from. If I click on Canada, Going to give me more information, right? So most of our traffic naturally is from BC, Ontario, Alberta, Quebec, and so on and so forth. So there is this; these tools should be used to 
give you a strategy on what to do to better serve your audience. That's the, the, the reason, the, the, the main reason I'm, other than the fact that it's cool, the main reason I'm sharing this with you is for you to, to see how you can use legit data, right? Not just guesswork to decide what to do to serve your audience better. Hopefully that one of, one of the tools, one of the strategies that you can use. I think once we um, start to get into content and you start developing some content and looking at how people are interacting with your content, um, this starts to make more sense. If you, if you have kind of managed to keep up and you have a website and you, you have some sort of analytics that you can look at, I recommend for you to go back, look at your keywords look at what people are searching for versus what keywords you're targeting. Look at these analytics and see, see how people are interacting with the website. And then try and build a picture for yourself of what's actually happening with your, with your uh, digital properties that you have out there. The, this is the reason where at the very beginning of this series, when I, when I shared with you that listen, digital marketing isn't just about Facebook and Instagram. It's, it's just not that. There's a lot more to it. This is the reason behind it. You can start to see that the, um, the various sources of traffic, let me share this again with you and go show you the source of traffic so you can just, can I get a thumbs up that you can see my screen properly? All right, good. Okay, so on here, if we go back on to... Let's go to, I think if we, maybe home even. So the top level page of Google Analytics for this property. Yeah, right here. I can scroll down. So it says, how do you acquire users? And this is the answer to that, right? So look at the traffic channels. This is, this is by date. And then it's giving me the various traffic channels by color down here. I don't like this way of sorting that much. If I click on source medium, this is a little bit better. You can see it's telling me how much of it came from Google organic. So people searched for it versus how much came from direct. These are people who know the business. They're typing it in versus facebook.com or instagram.com. Right, so this tells us where the, the effort that we're putting out there in terms of sharing our content, what's working versus what's not working, right? Or there's, there's another thing in here, if I'm not mistaken, it, t it tells me about um, the type of user that I'm dealing with, whether it's a user that's coming back versus a user that, that that that's the first time on the page. This is age, gender. I can't find it right now, but there is there 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 are things in here where it tells you who's a new user versus a, a user that's returning to your website, which is very helpful in if you're promoting something externally versus internally, right? Um, yeah. So what I want to do now, if you guys agree with, I think we have a little bit of time left. I want to see if there are any questions. Thanks, Yuri. I asked Shamak this question before, so maybe he's had time to think yeah. about it. The number of users that we have on the District 96 website is very, very low. I can actually count the physical people that I know are on the site doing work. Google mm -hmm. Analytics reports numbers that are much lower than that, though. So yeah, so yes, I, I I do remember this question. I apologize for not answering it earlier. There, when you first of all, when you say users, you're you're referring to hits on the website, not specific people, users, right? Specific people who are doing work on the website, writing blog posts, counting okay. heads, like. Okay, so what I suspect might be happening, and I, I don't know until I actually sit down and look at it, what I suspect might be happening is that the Google Analytics code is not installed properly. So it's tracking some pages and then not all of them. 
right? Okay. So, so maybe it's just on the first couple of pages or something. Like the, the the main page, the landing page. That's a possibility. I'm not sure if that's the case or not. Um, Google's numbers are, like I said, they don't tell you the truth, but it shouldn't be that off. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you if you have if you know, for example, you just said almost 2,000 people we send an email to with a link there should be at least 200 people visiting the site, something like that, right? Like, there, if, especially if yeah. the, the link is in, enticing. Yeah. Well, not that insight, enticing, and, but yes, there should be some people on there. So, okay, th that's a good thing, because what I'm doing is I'm looking at the numbers that are reporting, and they don't make sense to me based on the yeah. real world. So what I would say is num step number one is ask Rob to check the website to make sure Google Analytics code is on every single page of the website. Okay. Every single page, regardless of what the page is. Okay. That's step number one. And then and then we can take the next step if that doesn't resolve it. Next question uh, is, are the world stats impacted by things like international sanctions? Example, Iran, North Korea, et yes. cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so absolutely. So sanctions cause people not to be able to directly go to the website. Therefore, in many countries, such as some of the ones mentioned, people use VPNs, right? That, that stands for virtual private networks or uh, filters of some sort. So they, instead of coming directly to your website, they're going through a different channel. They're going through a different computer to come to your website. That for sure, 100% skews the geographic an analytics, right? So if somebody's sitting in the Middle East and they're using a VPN that's, that the machine, the actual physical computer is sitting in Japan, you're gonna see uh, as if it, it looks like the, the, the traffic is coming from Japan, but it's not, it's coming from the Middle East, right? So it skews that for sure, 100%, uh, but it, it could also skew the number of traffic, the number of visitors as well. That would be an experiment. I don't have, I don't know the exact answer to how it would impact the number of uh, visitors to the site. How often uh, to post on a blog and how long the articles yeah. of each blog. And okay. within that one, there is a good blog helpful to draw more audience and hits on the website. Yeah, so the answer to this question is it, it is completely dependent on your industry and on your particular audience. This is the reason I said you got to listen to your audience, right? So, I mean, I can see that Eva sent this question. So let's talk about it openly, right? So she, yeah. she's a real estate agent, right? So depending on, you know, not if I said for the real estate industry, your blog should always be 500 words. That's funny because I don't know who your clients are right? One real exactly. estate agent versus the next real estate agent, completely different. And we'll talk about this on in the session where we talk about content creation, because that's literally what this topic is. Um, so but to answer your question, 100%, it's helpful, as long as the content is actually helpful. So if you if you go get a writer to write your content, I think that's a mistake. I think you got to put the time in and create your own content. This is this goes for everybody, right? Create your own content, content, make sure it has that authentic voice to it. It's you. In other words, your clients are getting or your potential clients are getting to know you. Your 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 existing clients are um, strengthening that relationship with you because you're giving them good strong content. And then the frequency of it depends on the type of your content as well, right? So if you're spending, I don't know, 10, 20 hours, 30 hours writing one piece of very long blog once a month, right? But if you can, you can churn out a good blog, again, depending on your industry and audience, do it weekly. There are people I know that do micro blogs um, daily, and I love it. I read every single one of the things the guy posts, right? Every morning at like 5 a.m., I get an email with a blog that's probably a paragraph long, right? And I read it. It's a cool little thought that comes in. But if that same guy was writing 3,000 words, he wouldn't be able to send it daily. It's just too much, right? If you follow somebody like um, Paulo Coelho, you guys, anybody familiar with Paulo Coelho? 
the author. Oh, Paolo he's Coelho. Paolo Coelho, yeah. He's, you know, his blog is amazing, right? Like, and he almost sends stuff out daily, but his blog looks like quotes. You know, they're like little pieces out of his writing that, that is just amazing. Like you, you read it and you feel satisfied and you walk away. The quality, in other words, does not go away because of the frequency. That's important. Right, so you want to keep high quality content despite the fact that you have the ability to increase your um, frequency. So we will talk about this on the session that we have on content is dedicated to just content. So we'll talk about, I'll talk about my content creation strategy and then you guys can take it and customize it however you want or just ditch it and go with a different strategy. And, and I wanted to remind everybody, the next one is about Google Maps. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're bringing on your clubs and letting them know because those ones that don't have it, as you can see, it won't show up in a Google search, even just for Toastmasters. Uh, they don't even have to put in the city name. It'll just show up with oh, the ones closest to them. Um, that was our November workshop. For December, he's gonna be talking about email marketing. Now I know for some of you who'd run the small businesses, this is, uh, was a, the last big thing that I had when I was doing that is the, the drip emails. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if he's going to talk about those particular ones, but the marketing uh, around them is definitely important. You have tuned into and are viewing the District 96 Toastmasters YouTube channel. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel.